what was the love life of a Roman like? What did they get up to? And what weren't they meant to get up to? And just how rude was Marshall? Join me and LJ Trafford as we discuss her new book, Sex and Sexuality in Ancient Rome, on the Ancient History Hound podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Ancient History Hound podcast. My name's Neil, and in this episode, I was joined by LJ Trafford to talk about her new book, Sex and Sexuality in Ancient Rome. LJ Trafford is the author of a number of books about ancient Rome, including a four-book fiction series set in the tumultuous year 69 CE, also known as the Year of the Four Emperors, as well as the non-fiction book How to Survive in Ancient Rome, a guide for any would-be time traveller to the city in the year 95 CE. And you might remember that because last year LJ kindly came on and spoke about it. Before we get to the interview itself, I need to say a couple of things. To start with, and it might seem obvious, but given what we talk about, the content of this episode is adult. I just want you to bear that in mind. It's not for young ears. By the way, if this sort of area of history scratches an itch, well, I did a two-parter on STIs in ancient Greece and Rome, no pun intended, and you can find those episodes wherever you're listening to this episode. And on that point, actually, if you're on a platform that is able to have a review, then please give a review. Small-time indie podcasters like me, it's an absolute godsend to get a review. Okay, almost there now. If you want to get in touch, the Ancient History Hound podcast has its own Twitter account now, at Hound Ancient, and I'm still on Twitter as Ancient Blogger. And you can also find my website, ancientblogger.com, and get in touch with me at ancientblogger at hotmail.com. Finally, I do get round to answering some questions which were kindly sent in. Thanks for those. If your question wasn't answered, it's likely because we covered it, hopefully, during the episode. Anyway, I'm done now. Right, let's get on to the chat. Hi LJ, and welcome to the podcast for the second time. Around this time last year, we were talking about your book, How to Survive in Ancient Rome. We spoke about important things like drunk sieges, ill decorations, and you got your little promo for Domitian in there. But now you've got a new book out, which is called Sex and Sexuality in Ancient Rome. How did that come about exactly? It came about because the publisher who published um, How to Survive in Ancient Rome and Pen and Sword, after I'd completed that one, their commissioner editor said, did I fancy writing another one? And they gave me some some suggested titles I might like to write. And the one that stood out was this one, was The Sex and Sexuality in Ancient Rome. Um, because it's, it's a really fascinating subject. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's so much to it. And it was a kind of subject that I'd researched when I was writing my fiction books because I was covering the kind of final days of Nero. Mm. So it was lots of kind of sexual excesses. Yeah. So I did, um, I did a fair amount of research around that. And also because my kind of characters in the fiction book were slaves and kind of ex-slaves, I did quite a lot of research around kind of sexuality related to slaves and what was expected ah, of them okay, yeah. and, and what the rules were. Um, but what I kind of realised is that I never actually kind of explain that in the fiction books. So it kind of looks, to the reader, it's kind of a series of people having sex in different positions, but with no explanation as to why. Um, So I thought this was the chance to put the record straight, to say it wasn't just a load of kind of random kind of scene. Yeah, so I'm sure people weren't really going, I can't read on anymore because I don't know why they're doing that there. (laughs) There was a serious scholarly point behind it, oh, but yeah. like I say, I'd never explained it in the fiction, so I thought now is my chance to get all that stuff out and all that research I'd done mm. and just blurb it all out and, you know, learn some new stuff along the way when I was researching it. When I record a podcast, and one of the episodes I'll do, invariably, I know some of it, but half the fun, in fact, most of the fun, is reading all the new stuff. So how did you go about actually forming something out of your notes and and creating what you've done I think I generally start by reading sort of a general history book on that topic and that gives me my kind of starting point because I'll note who they're quoting which ancient authors they're using as examples and then I'll go back and read those ancient authors to go to the source Hmm. and I just I just start off there and then I just read as much as I can just tons and tons and tons of books and I just make copious notes in a notebook and that all kind of seeps into my head. And I'm quite lucky, Pen and Sword, for the last two, they give me what they want me to write. I get a brief. 
um, that okay. tells me that they want a chapter on contraception, they want a chapter uh, on, you know, the law, they want a chapter on abortion or morality. So yeah. I've got a kind of, I've got a structure already in place. So I, I know what I'm going to write about. I've just got to kind of fill it, fill out the details. That must be really quite helpful. It's really helpful. Mm. I wish, I wish, <laughs> I wish my fiction books did that. I wish they told me, write this and then this person will die and then this will happen and then that will happen because it would make it so much easier. Um, so yeah, so I have a structure that I can, I can write around so I, I know what the chapters are and I I mean this book is again like how to survive it's one of a series so there's all other ones set in different time periods there's a sex and sexuality in Victorian right. Britain so the kind of brief I was given was kind of geared to other time periods maybe there was kind of mention of what did the church think about <laughs> sex and sexuality <laughs> so I had to kind of think a bit beyond the exact brief yeah um, yeah but most of the briefs I get always start with an engaging look which I always interpret <laughs> as as funny so yeah. I, so anything I sit there and I take notes and I stick in index stickers in any page that just makes me laugh or makes me go what what yeah. um and yeah if it makes me go I'm, I'm sorry then I know that it's something worth including so I've read your current book there's a lot in there and you go from technical details through to the sort of stories that you don't want the vicar around for but what really impressed me was the range of topics that you dealt with and that you got the context and the nuance in them. And that's really quite tricky. When I produce content, the challenge I have is to take a topic and try and make it accessible, but not make it too simplistic because people can draw incorrect conclusions. So anyway, when I think of my audience, I want those that are new to the topic to be eager to learn and, and don't feel alienated or think that they're being almost ring fenced from, from learning more. And likewise, I want people who have a good knowledge to think that yeah I can still get something out of this and I think that that's what your book does so if you're someone who's looking for a stocking filler this Christmas I would thoroughly recommend it because it's some something that's accessible for people who haven't got a great deal of knowledge about the topic but it's also good for people who do because there's technical stuff in there that they probably won't know about and just before we start though where can people find you and make complaints about what we're about to talk about <laughs> Uh, but just follow me on Twitter, I think. Just just abuse me on Twitter. Um, it's just at Trafford LJ. It's probably the easiest Excellent. way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, and speaking of Twitter, gives me a perfect segue. I first stumbled across you because you were the curator and originator of Phallus Thursday hashtag. And if you don't know anything about the Phallus Thursday hashtag, you probably have worked out two things already. And to that point, I think that it's probably best to start with the Roman penis. It's pretty safe to say that this is an ubiquitous thing around Rome. Phalluses or phalli are pretty much everywhere. They're in art, they're in trinkets, they're on walls, on sculptures. You can't really go too far without them being somewhere. You can even see them on the pavements in some places as well. Why do you think, or how, how do you think Rome saw the phallus? Their fault, the general feeling is, um, from scholars, is their fault to be lucky. And, and that's why there's quite so many of them, because in a kind of world where the gods are unknowable and their plans for you are unknowable, in a world where, you know, disease is rampant and people die young of things that are, you know, very curable today, you need all the help you can get. You need the gods on your side. You need luck. So that's why you find so many. So you find them outside shop, shops in Pompeii, you know, mm. to help people's businesses. Um, you find them, you know, on rings around people's fingers to keep them safe and protect them from bad fortune. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so therefore it's, it's the luck. And that's why there's so many of them, because everybody needs luck. <laughs> I know that they have a, or rather they were thought to have a sort of apotropaic always get that wrong Ap yeah. I deliberately didn't say yeah that I word knew I would do that you know that word uh, it basically means word. yeah it, it means stopping evil magic or warding off ev evil magic that word they had that sort of quality and function to them which is why you sometimes see them as you said on the side of buildings in, in places like that and it's quite interesting because in some ways as we'll hear Rome was very small c conservative but in other other aspects it was completely liberal to the point of wow um i can't believe that this is going on i can't believe people are seeing this and again you would you would shock old ladies on the village green with just a basic walk around rome just looking at the kind of things that were going on but something that's often been asked to me or rather pointed out is that you have this sort of love uh, of the phallus 
And yet the statues don't always match up. And I know that that's not necessarily the case because I, statues tend to be an idealized version of what people want. They're not there to represent, wow, look at that. Uh, and we do have evidence and discussions around the, the, the penis, as it were, and the fact that, you know, the statues, they might not have been, or shall we say, it might have been a bit cold. But in reality, the Romans kind of had the same hang ups as we do in the modern day, or rather, some people have in the modern day, and that's to do with size. Yeah, I mean, there's a quote from Aristophanes, who's um, who's Greek, obviously, and he describes what the perfect male body is, and he kind of concludes it with strong buttocks and a small prick. Um, so yeah, there's this kind of <laughs> image that goes around that from the statues and that that a kind of a small penis, a compact penis, is a is a more desirable size. And when we get to kind of talking about kind of large penises, large penises are are, are kind of they're funny in ancient Rome. They're used as a kind of running gag. I mean, if you think back to Greece and the satyrs, yeah, the, kind of yeah. the vases, um, mm. you know, they've got their grossly enlarged erect penises and they're having their way with wineskins and yeah. goats. And, and balancing, balancing things. Balancing things on it. You know, it's something, something to laugh at. When I saw those vases, I kid you not, the first time I saw those vases, I, I thought I wasn't necessarily looking at the penis. I was admiring the sense of balance. Yeah, it's quite a party trick. It's quite it a is party a, yeah, trick. Yeah, not, not, perhaps not a party trick in the modern day, I should add that. So there's that kind of humour aspect to it, and there's there's also um, a quite a famous, I think it's a, a lamp, isn't it, of a, of a gladiator, and he's fighting his own huge penis with a <laughs> yeah. sword. So, it, again, it, it, that's another kind of gag, something yeah. something to laugh about. And you find, on you know, again, if you think about the vases for, for Greek comedy, you'll see the comic actors wearing kind of fake phalluses mm. as well, part the, of their costume. Yeah, the, the phallus has got a tradition with Greek tragedy and, and rather, should I say, Greek theatre. Uh, but again, if you listen to the podcast episode I did on the origins of Greek theatre, it was one of the functional things that happened at the beginning. But when it comes to Rome and the sort of jokes around size, shall we say, I, I looked up and found some good stories. I know that you've got one very good story. Yeah, so there was a guy, this comes from Seneca, and he talks about a guy called Hostius Quadra, I think it is, um, who's a singly vile individual, according to Seneca, and he was so vile that when he was murdered, kind of justifiably by one of his own slaves, the law kind of stated that if a slave murders his master, then the entire household of slaves have to be executed. Yeah. And this does happen. This isn't one of these kind of archaic laws of Rome, which is no, just no, there as a no. deterrent. It happens, and it happens yes. under Nero. And there was protests in the street from the people. And Nero said, well, I have to follow the law. And and they did. They executed a whole household of slaves, men, women and children. Um, but in this case, the emperor in this case was, was Augustus, who's the great moral moral leader. And he decided that Quadrus, Hostius Quadra was just so vile that he wasn't worth avenging. And so let let the slaves off and didn't follow the law. But he apparently used to go around bathhouses sizing up men and looking for large penises. Um, who He would then collect those men and take them back to his house um, where he would um, have sex with them or they would have sex with him, which he would watch in a very big mirror. Um, so you get these kind of stories that come out and it's about sexual degeneracy, really, the kind mm. of large penis. And there's, there's a similar one with the Emperor Alicballus. Um, who again sends scouts out um, across the empire collecting men with large penises and bringing them to his court to serve in his kind of um, his court as his officials. Well, it's good and, to have yeah, a hobby. It's good to have a hobby, yeah. He's got people who can do it for him. Quadra has to do it himself. <laughs> yeah, that's a sign of emperor and power, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but again, Elig El- El- Ballas is, is portrayed as a complete sexual degenerate and this is another sign of his sexual degeneracy and it's about sodomizing as well they're sodomizing him which is contrary to kind of roman moral codes so the collecting of the large penises is is a kind of signpost of this person is a moral degenerate you mentioned the baths and the baths are quite common it seems to be a place where people would go and oh to check each other out the first quote i'll start with actually is from marshall if you're not aware marshall Marshall will come up later in a quote that I can't read out. I I have to kind of beat most of it. His epigrams are, yeah, something you might want to think about reading before you read. But he says, Flaccus, if you hear a round of applause in a bathhouse, you will know that Marrow's dick is there. Which, 
fair enough. Okay. He also says about uh, a chap called Hillis. Apparently, he would give his last denarius to someone with an oversized cock. Petronius, in his Tyricon, there's a tale within a tale, as is often the case there. And they're talking about a chap whose member was so big that the man himself was to be mistaken for a tassel upon it. <laughs> Which, yeah, fair enough. Again, that seems to be um, quite, I'd, I'd say compliment. I'm not sure if it was a compliment. It was, Perhaps we'll put it down as an observation. So this idea that just because there were lots of statues with, you know, men with, shall we say, pretty penises, as Aristophanes would no doubt say, it didn't mean that the Romans weren't also considering the whole size thing. Yeah, um, Marshall has it. Marshall has another epigram, doesn't he, where he accuses someone of, I think it's Cotter, um, who's handing out dinner party invitations based oh, on yeah. the size of people's penises he's spotted at the baths. And know? he's getting, an, he gets annoyed. He gets annoyed because he doesn't get an invite. <laughs> so we've got the idea then that the the Romans had a bit. I don't know if we'd call it a, a running gag, but they certainly had a similar sense of humour, I suppose, in some ways to ourselves today. There were other things about the penis which uh, Rome thought was good or bad. and One of them was circumcision. Circumcision was seen by the Romans as it was by the Greeks as something that was just, no, don't do it. The law is quite harsh and anybody mm. who yeah. insert, gets themselves yeah. circumcised or circumcises their slaves. Oh, I didn't it's... know that. Yeah, so oh. the, the law states, yeah, it's anybody who gets circumcised or circumcises their slaves because obviously the slaves cannot consent to anything. No being slaves and it's exile it's harsh and then the doctor who performs it is facing execution it's treated kind of in the same kind of way that castration is yeah yeah and i think that's one of the things that really did surprise me researching this book because it never even crossed my mind circumcision as being treated that harshly and yeah it's it's a kind of it's akin to castration that you get similar kind of punishments laid down it's in the same kind of kind of ballpark as far as they're concerned which i no pun intended. <laughs> I'm trying to balance this episode out so it doesn't just look at men. In terms of women, what do we know about them? In the same sort of context as in kind of their body and yeah, yeah, like, like the, the female genitalia. How was it? How was it viewed in the sense of what was proper and what was right? If there was such a thing, you don't get many mentions. Like in all of kind of history, you don't get many mentions of vaginas. Um, no, but you do. Um, there's. When it when they're mentioned in kind of poetry, like in Marshall and that, it's kind of with disgust. There's not a kind of discussion yeah. of what makes a beautiful vagina, or you know, it's yeah, it's kind of disgust is what comes across. Um, and Marshall, you know, I mean, as you said, Marshall writes some very interesting epigrams, so, some of which you will struggle to find an English translation of. Yeah, even, even today, I do. Yeah. You open a book and you're like, oh, I need to look at this particular number epigram. Oh, mm. it's in Italian. They've yeah. not translated it, no. or it's just they're not, in Latin. <laughs> they're not going to. It's just everything's redacted. Everything's redacted, yeah. So you have to hunt high and low for some of the translations of this. But, yeah, I mean, Marshall has a poem about his, his girlfriend's vagina. It makes a noise. He doesn't like it. It's too noisy. You know, another one's is too wide. And he very unkindly then compares it to a whole... A whole I, suppose, I suppose it is quite funny if unkind, but a whole kind of roomy objects, including kind of a, a British pauper's trousers. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, there's not a sense of oh, this is beauty no. for women's lady parts. Um, when they're discussed, it it's that kind of jokey humour. And what was the what was the perspective in terms of shaving or anything like that? There's a, there's a, there's a line from um, Pliny the Elder, bless him, who you know, who's very shocked to see kind of women shaved lady parts. Um, to which you have to kind of wonder, well, where has he seen them? Was it mixed bathing day at the baths? There were baths where there were separate men's and women's sections, but there were also baths where kind of anything went. You know, not every bath was extravagant. They had different facilities, and some of them were known for being the place you went um, to get up to stuff, to meet women, just generally, you know. And it, so perhaps, perhaps he uh, accidentally went to the wrong kind of bath. <laughs> Could well be. Um, yes, to go back to pubic hair. Um, <laughs> you, again, it's another thing you don't see on statues. Um, yeah, but men and women with kind of removing body hair, it's that kind of, it's that narrow line that you find throughout Roman society, judgmental line that you can step mm. over side of and be on the wrong side of. Um, for men, it's a really fine line between not being too hairy and thus uncivilised yeah. or described as goat 
as Caligula was for being too hairy. <laughs> and then the other side of that is to kind of remove all your hair and then you're a bit of a dandy. Yeah. And then you've stepped over that line into less than masculine. And again, again, Marshall has, you know, poems about this and he describes one fellow where he says, oh, your cock is as smooth as a vulture's neck. Oh, and, you know, and various, various oh, other parts. I'm never eating <laughs> vulture again. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, women, yeah, would have trimmed or shaved or, but again, it's that kind of thin line between have you gone too far with the care of your body? I ask you this simply because I know you're such a fan of Flavian hairstyles. Um, so that obviously didn't end up anywhere else. <laughs> there was, <lady> hair. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't this kind of ornate thing going on. I've got to say, when we talk about Roman hair, I'm always slightly gagging to think about Nero's neck beard. That's the thing <laughs> that always gets me. I, I just, ugh. And I want to move into something a bit more upstanding now, morality. So our depiction of Rome generally is there are orgies going on. There are always parties. It's up Pompeii, which you may or may not know, depending on whether you're, you've ever watched British TV from the 70s. And it, it just everyone seems to be at it and doing all sorts. And I think there's a bit of license going on there. But I know that you've got a, a particular view on this. I think what is interesting about Rome and what I find interesting and kind of get, steered me on writing this book is that there's a massive contradiction at the heart of it. In that, as you say, we have all this sexual imagery that's come, you know, from the excavations of Pompeii and Herculaneum yeah. and elsewhere, where there are penises everywhere, where there are scenes of couples making love, where mm. it's on, you know, crockery, you know, yeah. everyday crockery in people's houses. You, <laughs> you, know, but then... you can't get away from it. It's just like, can I just have a scene of a, of a boat or something? Without... <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's absolutely everywhere. And, and it's in poetry and, you know, Suetonius writing his biographies of... 12 emperors has a section you know for their sex lives and it goes into very eye-popping detail particularly the chapter on Tiberius and what he got up to on Capri oh yes yeah <laughs> so there's this kind of image that it's everywhere but alongside that Rome's actually a very conservative society it's very moral mm. and they're very very worried about public morals and we know this because they go on and on and on about it um mm. in kind of satire and politics and it gets to the extent where they the the law the state actually intervenes and you get a whole series of morality laws that really start kicking in from kind of augustus mm. he's the great kind of moral master who brings in all these laws to try and compel people to live what they think of as the proper roman life which yeah. is getting married and staying married yeah not you know putting about all the place and having children if you have three children you get a tax break mm. under this law and women can kick out their kind of guardian who's meant mm. to oversee their financial affairs if they pop out three children according to the laws of augustus then they don't have to have that guardian and there's penalties for you know if you don't get married so if you don't get married i think it's a woman between sort of 20 and 50 and a man it's 25 and 60 there's kind of fines that get leveled against you so there's this kind of compulsion trying mm. to compel people to live this proper lifestyle i'm going to move from morality now and go into something that you referenced moments earlier, and that was Augustus, and that was his adultery laws. I think this fits quite well with what you were saying about how, how Rome was quite a quite a conservative place in terms of its views and what it's, had its expectations. So how did the ad adultery laws fit, and what were they? Well, I think the reason these come about is because Augustus is coming out of a period of I think a good decade or more of brutal civil wars that had happened after the assassination of Julius Caesar and before as well between kind of Pompey mm. and Caesar. So Rome's really been through it and a lot of people died. There'd been a lot of people killed in these civil wars and there was a concern over the birth rate and a falling birth rate. And obviously Rome needs needs children because it needs to maintain its army etc etc so there was that kind of concern and also a kind of I guess it's a kind of resetting of society almost yeah. um you find in Rome whenever Rome is really against the wall hmm. you find these kind of moments of a kind of a more kind of austere conservative view yeah. that comes out you know at any kind of the Vestal virgins suffer from this terribly, yeah, yeah. in which whenever Rome gets horribly defeated, like during the Second Punic War, yeah. you'll find suddenly a Vestal is accused of being unchaste yeah. and goes on trial. So there's this kind of link 
between maybe sexual immorality is not good for the state, particularly mm. women's sexual immorality. Yeah. Women's sexuality is tied to the state. So yeah. if you think about Lucretia, Lucretia's loss of chastity brings down the monarchy. You yeah. know, that's that's how severe it was. And you, you find a series of women at pivotal points in Roman history where everything falls apart and it's almost laid at their feet or they're, you know, or they're blamed for it in some way, like the Vestal Virgins. Mm. You know, something's gone terribly wrong. What is it? So Augustus is coming out of that kind of period. So you can kind of see where these kind of morality laws come from in that looking back at that era. Um, but yes, he brings in these laws. And as we said before, there's kind of incentives to have children and get married. But there are very harsh penalties for adultery. And obviously, as you'd expect, women get the raw deal. So a woman who mm. is convicted of adultery will lose, I think it's half a dowry and a third of her property. That could be the way around. Um <laughs> And she can't inherit anymore. Right. Oh, um, okay. She's not allowed to wear the stola, which is the dress of the kind of um, the Roman matron. Yeah. Um, Domitian brings in a later one where she's not allowed to ride in the litter. So mm. essentially it's kind of signposting her loss of status. Yeah. Um, her husband is forced to divorce her. He doesn't mm. have a choice in this. If he doesn't, then he's in trouble. And then they have to slap on, I think it's Domitian again, has to slap on further laws to stop people remarrying immediately afterwards. <laughs> right, because okay. clearly that was happening. Um, and there's, they get exiled as well. Wow, that's really hard. I mean, they do pretty much everything there. Yeah, they Short do. Short of killing you, that's everything gone. That's everything gone. And what is classed as adultery for a woman is different to what is classed as adultery for a man. So for a woman... Adultery is any, any sexual relations with anyone that is not her husband, full stop. Right, Whereas okay. with a man, it's freeborn women. So yeah, slaves yeah. are fair game to him. Yeah. Um, prostitutes are fair game to him. Yeah. Possibly lower class women and yeah. certainly an ex-slaves, freed women. That does That's not counted as adultery. Hmm. So it's a very, very unfair. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought they would be like Who'd that? Who'd have thought <laughs> Rome would be like that? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so it's very, very unfair in women. But they're, I mean, they have to, as we said, like with the remarriage one, they have to keep tightening these laws. Mm. So Tiberius, who's the emperor after Augustus, he has to close a loophole because apparently some women were registering as prostitutes to get round adultery laws so Ooh. they could have sex with whoever they wanted. Now, I, I, you know, obviously it wasn't going to be many women. You can't imagine it was many women. No. But it was clearly enough elite women. And I think one of them is named by Tacitus for it to, for him to have to make a move on that. Oh, okay. So you get that kind of tightened up. And, and later on, when you get into the kind of second, third century, the, the adultery laws get even tighter, um, kind of moving in towards a kind of Christian era. And you get kind of laws about, you can now be prosecuted under adultery laws for lending your house for the purposes of adulterous liaison. Wow. So it's really moving into association. It's association. In fact, yeah, bathhouses get included in this. Really? Because it's, uh, it really spells it out bit by bit by bit. Um, presumably to stop anyone from trying to wriggle out of it, or yeah. don't know, maybe it was to close these loopholes after people had tried to wriggle out of it. One thing that Rome certainly had was lawyers, so yeah. if there was a loophole, they'd find it. So it kind of starts off that you're not allowed to lend your house for the purposes of an adulterous liaison, and then it says, "By house, we also mean apartment." So you, know, <laughs> you do wonder whether someone has said, "Yeah, but I don't live in a house; I live in an oh, apartment." Wow. Yeah. Um, and then it's like. It doesn't matter if you own the house, even if you're renting it, you can still be prosecuted. So they're trying to keep this kind of thing of, you know, the kind of moral thing that you shouldn't be associating with adultery. And then they go further. And then it says, <laughs> this is where bath houses come in. And okay. then it's also included, as well as houses, apartment, also including bath houses yeah. and fields. Now, who's lending out their field for an adulterous liaison is what I want to know. That's just it's, baffling. I mean, it must have been a thing. A bit, well, they used to call it green feelers, didn't they? You know, kind of having sex <laughs> out in the outdoors. Somebody's having a green feeler somewhere, enough for it to be a law. And then it kind of goes on to, um, it doesn't matter if the couple have sex. It's your intention. You know, if, if you lent the house for the, because you thought they were going to have an adulterous liaison, it doesn't matter if they don't actually do the deed. It still counts because it's a principle. But it's a principle that they have to really labour point by point by point so that people can't wriggle out of it or... This you know, really, their lawyers. <laughs> that is something else. It yeah, does I mean, seem strange, but it's strange. Hmm. It's not. It's not clear whether they're kind of later amendments or whether it's all in the one law, which 
I don't know. It kind of, it kind of reads to me like somebody's some wag has gone. I don't live in a house, you know. Yeah. I, it's not my house. I rent it. You know? Yeah, I live in a field. I live in a field. They didn't have sex anyway. They yeah. just held hands. You know, it they, doesn't count. You know? They didn't get tree houses though, so that was yeah. an option. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So adultery laws. Yeah, they get more more stringent when you get into the Christian era. Then women are executed for adultery, and the, the oh. language gets much much harsher. Do we know if a lot of these cases of adultery occurred within the average? sort of Joe in the street or is that something we just don't know uh, we just don't know I mean with all of Roman law you, you can see the laws and they're there but whether they people were ever prosecuted under them mm. you have to really search I mean as I said the one about the women registering as prostitutes well that was a court case so yeah. that you know clearly that did happen yeah and you get the um Tastus which is the odd woman who gets prosecuted for adultery um but they're all elite women and obviously the imperial family is full of women yeah. who get exiled for adultery oh um, yes yes so, yeah, I mean, it, there's not the evidence for the lower classes to kind of say one way or the other. I mean, there's not a great deal of evidence of kind of prosecutions anyway, because mm. you know, our sources are limited in mm. whatever capacity. So we really don't know. But I mean, divorce, divorce was allowable and fairly easy to obtain in ancient Rome, unlike a lot of societies. Yeah. And it could be instigated by men or women. Okay, so a woman could actually instigate it. Yeah, I mean, technically she could. Whether Again, whether this happened... Or whether, you know, it's just there in law, but actually women are very much treated as second class citizens, so they wouldn't, you know, instigate divorce or whatever. But, you know, technically, divorce can be instigated by men or women, and it's fairly easy. But the children do always go with the man. Okay. By uh. law. I mean, there, obviously, there would have been cases where that didn't happen, but that was the kind of standard. The children go, are raised by the father. Thanks for that. The next topic is actually one that I had marked out to talk about from the get go, and that's homosexuality. I really like the way that you dealt with this topic in the book, because it's not a great word to use when we try and understand the relationships men had with men and women had with women in ancient Rome. Because, again, it comes with a a bunch of modern associations and biases and um, I suppose interpretations. And I I think we'll come to that as we go through the topic and hopefully people will see what we mean by that. I thought you unwrapped that really well to start with. You made that quite clear and then you went about how it was different. And again, I think we'll, we'll touch on those points. So can you can you tell us about homosexuality in uh, we'll start with the men so homosexuality between men in in ancient rome what were the rules how did it function um as you said there is there in latin there is no word for kind of homosexuality or heterosexuality there is no not in the way we understand it there is no kind of way of describing somebody who is solely attracted to the same sex or the opposite sex to the exclusion of anybody else they just don't think of it in terms like that so the whole thing about kind of elite roman male to be a good re- elite roman male is to be dominant which you would expect in a kind of patriarchal society yeah that has a massive empire and a massive army mm. um so the kind of rules around sex for elite roman males are as they are the, always the penetrator and not the penetrated because that is what makes a roman male yeah. A Roman male is dominate. A Roman male is a doer. They're not a receiver as such. Mm. Um, so that kind of that kind of seeps through to the subject of homosexuality. Um, and what we think of homosexuality today, which is consensual loving relationships between men of a similar age, a similar class, just doesn't exist in ancient mm. Rome. It's an acceptable form, which is, is very difficult to get your head around. Yeah. What is acceptable for elite Roman male, their acceptable partner of the same sex is somebody of a different class um, because if it was two elite male, well, one of them would have to be penetrated. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, and that's not, you know, that's taboo in Roman society. So his acceptable sexual partners of the same sex are someone of a lower class, are so basically slaves mm. or ex-slaves. You get a lot of stories around emperors and their relationships with their freedmen mm. or it's someone a lot younger. And by younger, we mean boys, which is, you know, not nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's pre-adolescent boys Mm. um, before they get their first beard. Mm. And there is reams of poetry. Um, Some of it is very beautiful poetry. You know, Catullus writes some very beautiful poems to a young man, um, you know, as does Marshall and Tibullus. 
Um, but yes, it, it's it's boys or it's people of a much lower social class and they are acceptable same sex relationships. So it's very different to how we think about it. Yeah. Which again, you know, we've talked about how different our two cultures are in the yeah. way that we view sex and sexuality. And this is one of these this is one of these topics where they see it very differently. It wasn't so much as the the people doing what they were doing, it was the status and what was being done. Yes. Those are the indicators. The idea of a married man having a relationship with another man, a sexual relationship with another man, it's completely fine. The only problem could have been is if you found out or it came to, to light that somehow he was the passive partner in an act. That would obviously cause problems or could could cause problems, shall we say. And we know that there were always accusations about people, particularly with the elite Romans. Julius Caesar is one such famous ancient Roman. I dare say plenty of people <laughs> listening would have heard of him. When he was younger, he went to um, he went on uh, sort of a diplomatic mission with the king of Bithynia. And there were loads of well, there were loads of rumours rather that came out about him and what he got up to them. And that stuck with him in enti- his entire political career. He had a famous saying set against him by uh, the elder Curio, and that was Caesar was every woman's man and every man's woman. And the obvious implication there being that he was as much a womanizer, but he was also happy to play the passive partner. And these kind of slurs were really quite damaging from a political sense. I mean that was I mean that was just one occasion that Oh yeah you know, yeah it's one event from decades before yeah. and like Suetonius will say it was the only blemish on his character on his morality which is you know it's quite something given the amount Mount Julius Caesar put it about with other men's wives that yep. was no blemish on his morality but this Nicomedes no. story that's the blemish and that's yeah, where he went wrong that is where he went wrong and yes it was referenced for decades afterwards hmm. so I mean yeah these were really quite damaging and Mark Antony gets accused of all kinds of things by yeah. Cicero. Yeah. In the second <laughs> Who'd <have> thought? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he must have had a very busy youth because he was forever with, you know, cavorting with actresses, throwing up in the forum, yeah. becoming a rent boy, yeah. having a relationship with his friend Curio. You know, he was just everything. Yeah. And it's, it, you get a similar thing. At Augustus gets accused of, you know, oh, Julius Caesar only adopted him in his will because he, you know, he, he gave in to him sexually as well. Mm. So the, it, you it's very rare that you will find any Roman male, elite male, who is not accused of this at some point. And I suppose it makes sense in a way because it was the easy attack option for any political rival. Yeah, Romans have this idea that your private life is indicative of your public life. Yeah. And that's why you get all these kind of accusations. I think it's quite interesting if you read the Suetonius biography of Julius Caesar and then you read Plutarch, who's Greek, and Plutarch doesn't mention the Nicomedes incident. Doesn't and he? he doesn't mention hardly anything about Julius Caesar's kind of private life. Right, okay. Whereas Suetonius lists it because yeah. they're not interested in that. But Romans are, I mean, part of the reason why this image of Romans has been kind of putting it about all over the place is because they're very interested in it. Because it's indicative of someone's character. Yeah. And as we say, it's a very judgmental society. So they're picking apart whatever rumour they can and making judgments about people, that, you know, of, of how good they'll be at being emperor or consul or whatever, you know. So, yeah, their, pri- their private life is seen to be indicative of their public life. It's seen as very important. And that's that's why you can, you know, stand up in the Senate and accuse someone of incest or whatever, or, you mm. know, or, you know, of having having been buggered by whoever, you know, whenever, I think, because it's, it's, it's so intrinsically linked to them. What do we know about relationships between women? Very little, very little. And what there is, is it... it pops up in martial and juvenile and, and kind of poets like that and how lesbians are presented is being mannish basically um doing what men do trying to be like men hmm. and that's about the strength of their kind of representation at all they don't seem to be viewed particularly well i know in ovid in his uh, metamorphoses he writes about iphis and ianthe and their possible relationship and that's obviously two women and he he couches it in very horrible terms. It's not deemed a pleasant thing. I, I found that when I did some reading on it, it didn't come across that it was particularly tolerated and, and it wasn't seen in, in a particularly good light. I think it's interesting that it, it is so sparsely mentioned because you would expect if you took someone like Messalina, who's like 
portrayed as all out harlot, you would yeah. expect amongst her kind of list of sexual immoralities, you would expect something like that, wouldn't you? You think, oh, yeah. right, what else could she get up to? Oh, have a fling with a woman. It, it doesn't. It's not there, you know. So I think that tells you something. Mm. In a way, it's not there. <laughs> you know, it's not something they considered much. That you know, it makes it into a few poems. You know, and the kind of women being too mannish, but it's not much. There's not much evidence there. No, there's uh, quite a, a curious, I say curious, um, it's damn right filthy epigram by Marshall. I'm going to give you a brief reading as much as I can. I know the language is, has been a bit strong in this episode, so I'm not going to increase that. But in case you want to look it up, it's Marshall epigram. It's book seven, uh, 67. Oh. I'm just going to bleep. I'm not going to read it all out. But I'm going to give you the middling part. I'll give you a brief overview of that. But it starts, and this is a translation, with Butch Philanus bleeps boys in the bleep. She goes to the gymnasium. She exercises. She lifts the weights that the, the boys can't, can't lift. She's you know, super strong. Then she goes home. She drinks six pints of unmixed wine, throws it up, and then comes back to it, and then eats uh, 16 ribeyes. Which is, you know, again, it's quite an achievement. But when she's done with that, she gets, I suppose, probably the best way of phrasing it, is she gets involved with the ladies. And it, it ends with the C word, so I'm definitely not going to say that. But it, it really is someone of huge extravagance on every every kind of thing. Someone who is unable to temper their or satiate their lust for food, for men, for women. <laughs> Amongst all that, the point that I find most curious is the fact that you've got there a a woman having sex with a man and having penetrative sex with a man it's sort of alluded to in a a letter from Seneca to Lucilius I think it is and it's this sort of almost a niche of men being dominated by women and again being sexually penetrated by women and I, I, I just didn't expect to find that. I'll be totally honest with you. It was a real, it was a real shocker. I think it falls out of this idea of women being these. If you don't keep them locked up, if you don't keep them controlled properly, this is what they can do. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, there's this, there's this kind of thing that runs through Roman society: this suspicion of kind of women's sexuality, and it runs through, you know, some of the myths, the suspicion that women enjoy sex more. And if yeah. they have more leeway, then you yeah. get a Messalina type and yeah. you get, you know, the fall of, you know, Rome, mm. you know, falls to pieces because the women aren't behaving as they should do. Mm. So that kind of that kind of runs through it. The final area that I want to look at is an area which I, I suppose is informed a lot by the previous topics we've discussed. And certainly there's areas that we'll probably recover. And that is prostitution. Uh, prostitution in ancient Rome was far, far more visible than today. You had female prostitutes being common, cliche, stereotype characters in plays of ancient Rome. There was all there was even a play called Truculentus, which was about prostitutes talking about their customers. There was even a feast day for male and female prostitutes in Rome, which occurred in April. How do you find, or how do you sum up prostitution in Rome? Um, it, as you say. It's a bit more visible because it's legal and it's taxed as well, um, which tells you something. Um, but yeah, it's there's kind of various forms of prostitution. And Suetonius wrote a book that is very unfortunately lost, which was called On Famous Whores, uh. which was about kind of famous prostitutes, which <laughs> seems like it might have been the kind of high end courtesan style. Yeah. Um, so you do find kind of brief mentions of that kind of style of prostitute at the high end and um, I think Pompey has a mistress called Flora who's quite famous as a famous courtesan and so there's a few of them get dotted about um there seems to be a lot of prostitution that goes on in bars yeah and we know this because there are laws again <laughs> Roman laws yeah. slamping out le- loopholes of you know designating exactly what prostitution is in bars and mm. if you have girls and you're running them then you are a madam you are not a yep. bar you know you're not a barkeeper and you will pay the tax mm. um so we know that happened um i think in pompeii there was something like 35 brothels yeah they've tried to been, work it out yeah. yeah and i think the difficulty they had in pompeii was identifying exactly what a brothel was and it comes to a 
a more general point about prostitution, and that's that prostitution, pun intended, was very fluid. It could occur in a number of places, in a number of locations. I don't think prostitution was dictated by where it happened. It was just an activity that could occur very informally or quite formally at a number of locations. We have like the street, the street walkers who tout yeah. business in arches. Yeah. So if you think about Roman architecture, it's all yeah. arches. So, yeah. you know, that's that's quite a lot of women. Um, but yeah, as you say, there's, there's a difficulty in identifying what is a brothel. And Mary Beard talks about this quite well in her book on Pompeii. Yeah. Because the graffiti in Pompeii is quite in your face. <laughs> yes. Yes. But does it mean, because it, in a house is a graffiti saying so-and-so does this for five assets? Yeah. It, it could just be a slander. I say if you go into most toilet, most public toilets... And some pub toilets, they'll have a number and a name. And it might just be a wind up, but you don't know. But I mean, the the, the identifiable brothel, you know, I mean, in Pompeii, it's a pretty seedy place. It's just very small rooms with kind of stone beds in, with lots of graffiti on the walls and images, no natural light, just a curtain to separate them. It's pretty, it's pretty nasty stuff. And I think it's worth pointing out that prostitution in ancient Rome your elite Roman male doesn't really have a need to, no. to visit a prostitute because he has slaves sadly mm. and freed slaves and mm. they are his to do whatever he wants to he doesn't need to pay a prostitute so prostitution at that level is very much for the lower classes yeah there's, I mean there's all kinds of stories again in Suetonius and Tacitus about mm. Nero and Caligula and Elibalus etc setting up brothels in the palace and yeah. I think what's interesting about these stories is these brothels that they're supposedly setting up, the prostitutes in it are freeborn women. Yeah. Because that's what's off limits. Mm. That's your kind of that's your kind of naughtiness, yeah. if you like. Because, you know, there's there's laws protecting freeborn women from that sort of activity. Well, these are the same sort of emperors that would then make uh, senators fight in the games. Yeah. They would they're all about subverting the norm. Yeah, I mean, whether any of these brothel stories are true, I mean, it's yeah. debatable. But yeah. I think it's an interesting, it's interesting that it's an anecdote and that mm. it's particularly freeborn women because they're the ones off limit. They're the forbidden. Yeah. And that, and that, as you say, it's the subverting yeah. of their role is what, you know, and it's interesting that these anecdotes exist because then it tells you a lot about Roman society. One thing that I didn't get to mention that I was going to mention earlier, and I think I might as well just throw it in here anyway, was when we were talking about sort of penetration, one of the things that comes up a fair amount is oral sex. Oral sex is just a no, full stop. Because if you're, again, a no for a, shall we say, a, a Roman citizen, because if you're have it, if you're performing oral sex on someone, then you are being penetrated. That's how the Romans saw it. it so it's it's quite interesting, again, to see that as something that the Romans really thought was was just was wrong and then again there are there are often these insults that get banded around particularly around the mouth if you were thought to be someone who who practiced oral sex on either men or women then jokes about your mouth would often follow suetonius writes one about quintus remius palaemon and he says that he was talking to a lot of different people and he went up to kiss someone and someone cried out do you wish to mouth everyone whom you see in a hurry and the implication was that, that that guy was often performing fellatio on men and women. Yeah, there's a kind of sliding scale of what, what's acceptable and what's not. Mm. And yes, um, um, performing fellatio is unacceptable because, mm. you, as you said, you're being penetrated in your mouth and the mouth is sacred for various reasons. It's where you take oaths, etc. It's where you do religion, state yep. religion, incantation. So it's kind of sacred. And then beneath that is the forming oral sex on a woman because then that's a woman's genitals penetrating you which is the Even worst worse. the worst insult that is yeah. thrown about in ancient rome is to be called a cunning lingus mm. and that is like just just beyond everything mm. to be accused of and you get these kind of i mean a lot of the graffiti in kind of pompeii therefore when you look at it it's really very very offensive because people yeah. are accused of doing exactly that mm. <laughs> it is obscene and it's in a way it's fantastic because it's great to have that sort of stuff written down because it gives us that insight even if it's not pleasant it does give us an insight because you can see what the person on the street might be thinking and might be saying about someone else as opposed to something else uh, an emperor does or um, a roman senator does 
I mean, I think we've got to bear in mind of all this. I mean, these might be the kind of cultural norms mm. of what is expected, but whether people keep to all of these and mm. keep within their nice narrow lane of this is how you will have sex, you mm. know, it's it's debatable, isn't it? You know, in a city of a million people, either, you know, there's enough evidence to show that people didn't, you know, strictly adhere to no. what was expected. In uh, I'd imagine that everything was going on there. And like you said earlier on, you tried to that's why these laws kept having to get cleverer and cleverer to stop people getting up to all sorts in the fields <laughs> i think we've covered a fair amount there and I, I just want to go back to your your book and just say if you want to know more about this sort of thing and why not after hearing some of the things we've spoken about then you know where you can find the book i did ask for a few questions and we i got some questions thrown back at me which is great i try and ask people on social media and other places you know what do you want to know and I, the first one is, how did beauty standards for both genders change over time and why? It's quite hard to track kind of yeah. beauty standards. I mean, if you think if you think of statues, say, of gods and goddesses, the, mm. the figures don't change much over the mm. centuries. They're all a kind of ideal shape and they stay that kind of shape. Mm. Um, you don't suddenly get oh, you know, much huger bottoms at a certain part, you know, in Roman history. No, Hair that's a good point. Yeah. Hair is a good one because hair changes, women's hair changes, mm. go up to my favourite period, which is Flavian lady hair, which is where yeah. it gets big, big towers of kind of curls, beards. Going yeah, they come in, yeah, Hadrian, when Hadrian starts starts uh, the beard thing. Yeah, I mean, Pliny the Elder, you know, spends a lot of time getting offended about latest fads, kind of connected <laughs> with beauty. Oh, so yeah. he's offended by perfume. Yeah, so yeah, so Pliny will moan about that, and he'll moan about all oh, people wearing purple and using purple, you know, to cover their couches and things. <laughs> and he'll moan about, you know, people spending too much time over their beauty routines. Yeah, and, you know, you got Popeye bathing in you know ass's milk and stuff like that, which he sees as over top. And apparently, there was a fad for people drinking perfume, so really? their inside would smell as sweet as their outside. Which you, I'm kind of whippling on this, and what is wrong with you people? You know, yeah. just... isn't it easy enough to die in ancient Rome? Why are you trying to make it easier? Um, I did have a friend at university who once tried to drink aftershave. That oh. didn't go down very well, and I definitely would not suggest doing it. No, no. no. <laughs> um, <laughs> did the culture become more or less permissive over time, and what led to periods of reactionary attitudes? I think we covered this a bit, didn't we? Yeah. We talked about Augustus coming out mm. of the Civil War. So periods in which, and actually when the adultery laws and everything gets more severe going on to second, third century onwards, that's coming out of a period of the kind of the third century crisis where you've got emperor after emperor after emperor. So you've got this <laughs> period of instability and then the laws, all of the laws get more severe. Um, so yeah, yeah, they it comes out of when Rome's up against it then yeah. you tend to get these more moralists coming in and going, I'm going to sort this all out. We need to go back to the old ways and become farmers. And, you yeah, know, let's go, yeah. We should all stop drinking. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you <laughs> should. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, the, this, uh, the next one is, as it is frequent for today's society to interpret homosexual relationships as platonic or friendship, how frequently do you think this causes false analysis of said relationships? I, I would say actually the opposite is true in ancient Rome. As we've kind of said, most kind of politicians, most male politicians will be accused of kind of being homosexual, being a passive homosexual mm. when they weren't. So any kind of friendship mm. is being inter interpreted yeah. to as, be yeah, hom yeah. as homosexual rather than the opposite way around of people interpreting a homosexual relationship as being platonic. They've got it the other way around. How deep did Roman knowledge about human sexual reproduction go? Did the Romans ever consider the idea of contraception? I know that contraception you, is, is actually in the book. Yeah, I mean, they do. They understand a fair amount about human reproduction. I mean, we're kind of Roman medicine. A lot of it, you spend a lot of time going, yes, 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 yes. Mm. And then, what? You yeah. Know, <laughs> it kind of throws you out with a fact. Like, sensible, sensible, sensible. No. Um, so, yeah, so they believed both men and women produced sperm is what they believed. Mm. And they believed that um, if the man's sperm was stronger, then you would get a boy child. And if the woman's sperm was stronger, then you would get a girl child. Right. They also believed that kind of um, women were inverted men all the opposite way around. Okay. So, yeah. So women were kind of men inside out. So the kind of vaginal canal is the penis right. and the ovaries 
are the testes. Okay. If you think of it like that. So yeah. so they understood some. And they did have contraception. Yes. And um, some of it probably more successful than other bits. Yeah. Of it. They had um, <laughs> various barrier methods. So things like wool soaked in things like olive oil and honey that would maybe stop sperm getting through. Uh, practice like the river method, which has never been successful throughout all of no. history. Um, and they had, then you get onto kind of various not so nice kind of concoction so things like mm. boiled mule testicles mixed with juice of the willow tree and vulture dung which is one of Pliny's and then you've got things that like, there's one that you would smear around the vulva which involved white lead now um you oh. know what white lead makeup does to your face so um hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> and then you have ones which are kind of post-sex which is um trying to expel the sperm post having having had your way which involve things like jumping up and down and crouching and sneezing and having a cold <laughs> drink, um, which all of which is a bit of a passion killer. But I mean, yeah. the, wor- the worst one that I've come across, which is uh, this is more like of an amulet rather than mm. contraception. This is another one of Pliny's, which is to find a certain spider whose head you cut open and there should be two little worms in there, which you then tie to yourself whilst you have sex. And that's a contraception. That's the hairy spider amulet, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 it feels more like magic amulet charm rather yeah. than anything that practically worked. <laughs> or unless it was the ultimate contraception in that the woman was just, uh, uh, no, not while you're wearing that. Yeah. And therefore <laughs> nothing happened. And there we go. Uh, how prominent was pleasure for both parties? Was the female orgasm even considered a thing? There is. Um... Ovid, in his books on the art of love and acts of love, yeah, mutual pleasure is mentioned. Um, ah, okay. I think I've got a quote here. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, Ov- Ovid says about it, that that's the fullness of pleasure when ma- man and woman lie there equally spent. And he mentions women moaning and crying and, you know, advises them not to fake it, basically. Okay. Um, so the idea of mutual pleasure is there. And you get in a lot of medical texts, you know, kind of, Sex is almost prescribed for illness in that, you know, um, I think it was a case of a woman. I can't remember what her symptoms were, but her prescription was she was a widow. The prescription was she should get married again and have lots of sex and that would help her. So it's quite often seen it. I mean, sex is seen as something that is helpful to you that can help help cure illness. Too much sex can cause illness. You said that Ovid advised against women faking it, which suggests then that <laughs> the Romans were obviously um, aware of that, too. Yeah, could be, could be. I mean, I mean, it sounds like they're mentioning the kind of female orgasm, but it's not kind of spelled out. But there's enough mm. there that you think you could piece yeah, it together. You could piece it together, but yeah, mutual pleasure. It, it's there. It's not just kind of women lie back and think of Rome. It's you know, they meant to, you know, it's, it's a medical text. It's you know, it's encouraged that they should enjoy sex for the conception of conceiving ah. new, new Romans. Well, look, I just want to say thanks very much. Again, if people want to get back to you and complain about the vile content in this in this podcast. I, t- I toned it down. I toned it down. I didn't quote any Catullus. I, I really <laughs> held back. <laughs> well, I was originally going to read out that entire Marshall epigram, and then I thought, yeah, no, I'm just going to leave that completely be. Uh, but Catullus, yeah, he's uh, he's another one that is worth reading is it daisy dunn who wrote a really good book on catullus? oh catullus yeah it's uh, really good yeah i think it's daisy dunn if you get the chance and you can find it thoroughly recommend it it's a brilliant book uh, but obviously read this book first <laughs> so i just want to say thanks again i was just gonna say thank you very much for inviting me on it's been fun no been fun. no thank you for coming on and i really hope my mum hasn't listened to this and until such time as i chat again take care and keep safe <laughs>